autumn months of 1941, in the states of North and South Carolina, the United States Army held extensive peacetime maneuvers. Every component of every service was represented. Some traveling more than 1,500 miles in convoy. In most cases, advance guards had been sent ahead to prepare the base camps, clearing the ground and erecting tents prior to the arrival of the main body of troops. Advance engineers had arrived early in order to set up adequate supplies of purified water drawn from the available natural sources. Thoroughly filtered and properly chlorinated, the water was constantly tested for purity, providing the troops with safe water for drinking. The Signal Corps had also gone in advance of the rest to construct a vast network of communication lines throughout an area normally lacking in adequate wiring. New poles. New post holes. And hundreds of miles of new telephone wire were necessary for the elaborate military phone system. And for the teletype machine. Camps were soon established. Shower systems were made available to dusty troops. Lining up for chow, the soldiers eat food prepared in field kitchens. During the entire maneuver period, enormous quantities of supplies had to be furnished to the troops by the Quartermaster Corps. Base railheads were established throughout the area for the distribution of all sorts of food supplies to the various camps and regimental supply depots. Furnishing proper supplies of gasoline to the mechanized and motorized forces was an important part of the quartermaster duties. Gasoline was pumped from tank cars into rows of standard five-gallon cans, which were then transported to the troops in the combat zones. Within the theater of operations, maintenance of replacements and repairs for damaged equipment was of great importance. Field tool shops were maintained close to the fighting zone. Each shop complete with the various tools, machines, and other equipment necessary to obtain the maximum service from motorized units. Throughout the area, base and evacuation hospitals were set up for the treatment of both technical and actual casualties. A real casualty. A broken ankle is brought to an evacuation hospital for setting. When the cast has been carefully set, the soldier is transported to a base hospital for convalescence. Technical casualties assigned by umpires during combat are shown returning to their organizations after appropriate detention in the hospital. Heavily camouflaged, extensive munition dumps were maintained by the Ordnance Department.
shorter containers for heavy artillery are loaded onto a truck by ordnance soldiers. In the field, the Signal Corps maintained vital combat communications networks with highly trained message center operators relaying information over miles of wire. While technicians tested and maintained telephone efficiency. Between a command post field radio and an operator in the field, communications are maintained. And skilled repairmen were constantly at work on the wide variety of equipment needing repairs. Guns of many sizes and types were used tactically by the field artillery. Maneuvered into a tactical position, this big rifle figured importantly into the umpiring of red versus blue. The barrel is raised to a designated position and, theoretically, fired. In similar action, an anti-aircraft crew pumps practice shells into its gun. While elsewhere, an artillery crew fires its howitzer with precision. In the middle of an open field, a large gun is effectively concealed by a flat top camouflage net. Behind the lines, a horse-drawn field artillery battery leaves its base camp and files down a road toward the zone of combat. Upon arrival in the maneuver area, the horse cavalry established picket lines and suitable watering tanks. Feed supplies for the horses when in base camps were effectively maintained. Veterinarians were in the field with the troops, safeguarding the health of the animals. A cavalry troop threads its way through a wooded sector on a reconnaissance mission. Taking full advantage of the concealment provided by the dense foliage of the woods, this troop is engaged in scouting the disposition and location of an enemy flank. Crossing a small stream, they emerge onto a Carolina road. From a concealed position in thick woods, scout cars of the mechanized cavalry move out of cover quickly and take defensive positions. In a major infantry attack, a section of infantry soldiers advances by rushes across a cotton field. 
Notice how each man takes advantage of natural cover. A machine gun crew of the defending forces rushes its weapons to the rear, while an observer watches the enemy movements. After the gun is in place, the defending crew fires at the advancing enemy. A section of the defending infantry takes cover behind a haystack, establishing protecting riflemen in a nearby barn. In a large-scale river crossing operation, a crew of soldiers launches a heavy assault boat. Paddling to the opposite side under a protecting smoke screen, the soldiers storm the shore to take resisting defenders. A 37 millimeter anti-tank gun is ferried across and brought ashore to give protection to engineer troops as they construct a footbridge. Section by section, the footbridge is assembled quickly and infantry races across to drive the enemy sufficiently far back so that a 10-ton ponton bridge may be built without danger. The first ponton goes into the river, and piece by piece the bridge is constructed. Soon, motorized vehicles are rolling across to continue their advance. Elsewhere, beside a technically demolished bridge, engineer troops build a timber trestle across a small stream. Working closely with the various components of the ground armies, both in reconnaissance and combat missions, the Army Air Corps was a vital part of the Carolina maneuvers. The construction of many new airfields was necessary in order to accommodate the large numbers of planes required for the extensive operations. After tons of earth had been removed, the field is leveled by bulldozers and graders. Hundreds of sections of portable landing mats are placed on the field, leveled and firmly fastened together. The portable landing mats make a firm landing area through which in time, grass will grow, camouflaging the field from aerial vision. A plane comes in for a landing on the new airfield and turns around. It takes off again after proving the field ready for use as a major airfield, capable of sustaining even the heaviest bombers. During the course of the maneuvers, parachute troops were used in strategic operations.
Elsewhere, in an attack by airborne infantry, a fleet of big army transport planes roars in for a landing. The big planes taxi into position, and even before the last plane is on the ground, the soldiers have landed, fully equipped with rifles, machine guns, and other small arms. From every plane, the men alight and run for cover of the nearby woods. In their advance, these men should have dispersed, seeking cover as rapidly as possible, as is done by these soldiers in a similar action. Spreading out widely, they advance in small groups, taking every advantage of cover and providing the enemy with poor targets. Instead, and taking no cover, using no concealment, the airborne soldiers bunch together as they advance. So closely, in fact, that one well-placed enemy shell or grenade could make casualties of almost every one. An airborne 37 millimeter gun is set up in a nearby cornfield and is rapidly camouflaged. The rifleman on the road is of little protection to the gun crew, for he has failed to take proper cover. Completely invisible to enemy scouts, this soldier is making full and correct use of cover. <laughs> 